So, good morning, students. Once again, this is Obin series. Today, we are coming to learn about ocular muscles and all that they do in the eye, of course, with the support of the cranial nerves. For better understanding, remember that the eyeball is highly connected to the brain. This is the eyeball, the eyeball, that is the brain, okay? And the eyeball, as I've told you in previous classes, is joined to the brain to the optic nerves, okay? Remember, one optic nerve comes here, the other one comes here, they form the optic chiasma. We give three dimensional view. So, information from the eyeball enters the brain through the optic nerve, but at the same time, information from the brain comes to the eye through the optic nerve. There's something you should know that one optic nerve has nasal fibers, the nasal fibers decassate or cross to the contralateral side, whereas the temporal fibers say axillateral or remain at the same side. 52% of the fibers cross to the contralateral side. So, if you have any information coming from the eyeball to the brain, it passes through the optic nerve, which is the chiasma. Part of the information goes to the contralateral side to form through the contralateral optic tract. And part of it remains axillaterally. Okay? This is the thalamus. Okay? Then, con continuation of the optic tract, you have the optic radiations which finally come here to form the primary visual cortex and that is a current fissure. So this is it for you. Other thing you should know before we enter into the proper presentation is the ciliary ganglion. It's one of the soft tissues within the orbit. It is found here one centimeter in front of the annulus of zinc where the estrocular muscles meet. Okay? So this is the ciliary ganglion we find here. It's good you know about it. Okay. So this is the ciliary ganglion here again. And I said it's found one centimeter in front of annulus of zinc. Annulus of zinc is where all the estrocular muscles join together within the orbit. Once in time in front of it is what? The ciliary ganglion. What is the ciliary ganglion that you should I want you to know about? The ciliary ganglion is a nervous structure with three major roots: a long sensory root, short motor root, and of course sympathetic root. The long sensory root it gives sensory innervations to the cornea, to the ciliary body. And the iris. What does the short motor root do? The short motor root contains parasympathetic fibers. So the parasympathetic fibers, what they do is that one, they help in forming part of the tracheal nerve to innervate the constrictor pupillae muscle as well as the ciliary muscle of accommodation without which accommodation cannot take place so now sympathetic root it brings sympathetic fibers from the carotid plexus and with this is able to innovate the dilator pupillary muscles to help dilate the pupil so that is the ciliary ganglion so sometimes it's a bit difficult to understand certain phenomena which happen in the eyeball. You've heard about a direct and consensual reflex when light is thrown into the eyeball to the pupil. So normally, when you shine light into one pupil, the constrictor opening muscle contracts to narrow the aperture of the pupil to decrease the amount of light which enters the eyeball. So, for example, let's take the left eye. So, that is the left eye. So, if you shine light to the left pupil, there are four other neurons which helps 
in production of the direct and of course the consensual reflex. The first order neuron is found within the retina at the level of the ganglion cells. At the level of the ganglion cells, I think I can make my image larger. The second order neuron is found at the level of the protector nucleus. Okay. The four, the third order neurons is found at the west part nucleus, which is part of the third cranial nerve. The last but not the least other neuron is found at where, where the ciliary ganglion is found within the orbit. So, let's give an example. We shall light into the left pupil. The aperture of the pupil reduces because the third cranial nerve helps in construction of the constrictor pupillae muscle because the pupil doesn't want too much light to go into the retina, so it will constrict. When there is very little light or in dim illumination, the pupil dilates. Why? Because it wants to capture the least amount of light around to read the retina so that the individual can see very well. As you can notice here, once light and any information going to the brain is called afferent afferent and uh, any information so you can see that this information going to the brain is called afferent we we'll follow the arrow and any information coming from the brain is called efferent as you can see here okay this is efferent and that is efferent so as you can see here you shall light into the people here the information travels through the left optic nerve 52% crosses to the contralateral side. Okay, so 52% travels to the right side. You follow the arrow to stimulate the right protector nucleus. The right protector nucleus stimulates bilaterally. Okay, you can see the fibers coming here. It stimulates both the left and the right in the west part nucleus. And in any case, if you follow the arrow, if you follow the right, you see the efferent information coming here. Coming here, it follows the ciliary ganglion. And through the ciliary ganglion, it stimulates the parasympathetic fibers, which innervate the constrictor pupillae muscle to constrict the people. In this case, it will end up being what the consensual reflex. So that was the right side. If you follow the left side, it's the same phenomenon. It comes this way, ciliary ganglion stimulated, and in the end, it comes here to constrict the people. That would be the direct reflex. So let's follow ipsilateral stimulation. Okay, we reach here. This is the optic chiasma. Ipsilateral, the information travels through the left uh, communication systems stimulates the left protector nucleus there is the information is bifurcated you see part of it goes to the right in the west bar nucleus and another part comes to the left in the west bar nucleus so it will follow the different pathway in that order to help in the constriction of the people okay so now let's talk about some of the muscles within the eyeball so for your information there are two major uh, muscles we have the intraocular muscles and then what the extraocular muscles the intraocular muscles are all related to the iris one of them is the ciliary muscle of accommodation, which is not projected here. It tells in accommodation. And during accommodation, the crystalline lens becomes thickened, flattened, to help us to see things which are close to us, which are in the diameters of our hand being stretched in front of us. And we are able, during accommodation, we are able to read, we are able to look at our watch, 
we are able to load at our dashboard when we are driving and things which are within 36 35 centimeters from our body now let's narrow down our discussion to two of the major other muscles within the iris we have the constrictor pupillae muscle also called the sphincter pupillae muscle as you can see here is found in concentric pattern at the inner portion of the iris concentric portion pattern at the inner portion of the iris that is the sphincter pupillae muscle now we have the dilator pupillae muscle which is thrown in radial folds in this direction within the iris that's the dilator what the dilator pupillae muscle do it helps in what well, dilating the pupil as you can see here while the sphincter pupillae muscle constricts the pupil there are other slides that can show this better so that is the pupil if you see the inner portion of the iris with concentrically oriented muscle those muscles are known as the sphincter pupillae muscle and thrown in radial folds going to the periphery is the dilator pupillae muscle dilator pupillae muscle they then go dilate the pupils okay physiologically people will be dilated in dim illumination and people will be constricted when there's bright light around so we realize that the people here is constricted when the uh, sphincter pupillae muscle contracts so again, there's another demonstration here for you. You see the people here has this innerly line muscle, which is called the sphincter pupillae muscle. It's internally oriented. And look at the radially oriented muscles going to the periphery. Those are the dilator pupillae muscles. Okay. Remember, dilator pupillae muscle, when it contracts, it dilates the pupil. And the sphincter pupillae muscle, when it is stimulated, constricts the pupil. Another thing you remember is that the dilator pupillae muscle gets its other authorization from the sympathetic nerve, which is the sympathetic root of the ciliary ganglion. But the sphincter pupillae muscle gets its authorization, order, or function from the tracheal nerve, specifically the parasympathetic fibers that come from the ciliary ganglion. So, now let's look at the extraocular muscles. Okay, this is the superior rectus found here, that is the lateral rectus, this is the inferior rectus. This is the media rectus, this is the superior oblique, and that is the inferior oblique muscle. Traditionally, the extraocular muscles are muscles which help in movement of the eyeball in several positions. Okay, so as you can see here, the superior rectus muscle. All right, helps movement of the eyeball upwards. But even before we talk about in which direction they move the eyeball, you should remember their innervations. Okay, their innervations. So, when you hear the word oculomotor nerve, oculomotor nerve, oculus, oculomotor is divided into two, oculus and then what? Motor. So, oculus refers to the eye and the moto refers to movement. So, oculomotor nerve, in other words, helps in majority of the movement of the eyeball. Okay? So, now let's... It has two major portions of the oculomotor nerve. Hmm? The upper portion and then the lower portion. The upper portion is smaller and it helps in, in innovation of structures which are upwards. Apples and what apples while the lower portion which is bigger portion helps in innovation of structures that are a bit at the lower side 
So whose stretches are upwards? Remember the superior the upper part okay helps in innovation of the levator papillary superioris muscle. What does this muscle do? It helps in opening of the eyelid. Okay, is the major muscle without which one cannot open one's eyelid. So that's the levator papillary superioris. That one that structures the upper portion of the glomotor nerve in the veins. The other portion it innervates is the superior rectus muscle. I told the other portion in the base which are up. So it innervates also the superior rectus. Okay. What does the superior rectus muscle do? It sends the arrow upwards, as you can see with this arrow upwards. Okay. Right. It is also important to know that the inferior portion of the oculomotor nerve helps in innervation of the media rectus, which sends the eyeball medially. Okay. Inferior rectus, which sends the eyeball inferiorly. It also innervates the inferior oblique, whose functions we'll discuss very soon. Apart from this, we have the lateral rectus, which is innervated by the abducent nerve or the cisgranial nerve. And of course, we have the superior oblique muscle, innervated by the trochlear nerve or the fourth cranial nerve. Okay, so let us now talk about functions of the extraocular muscles. Let's start with the superior. Remember that without their innovations, this muscle cannot function well. And when there's a palsy of these cranial nerves, the muscles cannot function. Now, so superior rectus, what does it do? It moves the eyeball superiorly. There's something you should know that all the rectus muscles their function follows their name. So if you hear superior rectus, it means move the eyeball upwards. If you hear media rectus, it moves the eyeball medially or toward the nose. If you hear lateral rectus, it moves the eyeball laterally. If you hear inferior rectus, it moves the eyeball inferiorly. Okay? So, in this diagram, you may see some other arrows. It means that the major arrow denotes the primary function of the eyeball. The second bigger, biggest, or the second arrow, which is uh, the second biggest, is denoting secondary function, and the smallest arrow denotes tertiary function of the muscle. Those which don't have extra arrows means that they have only one primary function. Okay. So, let's talk now about superior oblique muscle. Its primary function is to move the eyeball laterally and downwards. Similarly, the inferior oblique, its primary function is to move the eyeball laterally and what? Upwards. Okay? All right. Okay, then. So, we should also know that there are secondary functions of these uh, muscles, okay? Look at the superior oblique muscle critically with the purple arrow here, okay? So, the superior oblique muscle functions, depresses the eyeball. In other words, it brings the eyeball down very well when it is in adduction. Adduction means that the eyeball moves towards the nose. Okay, so superior oblique muscle function, one of its other major function is to move the eyeball down and inward. Follow this arrow, it's moving downwards like this, but at the nasal side. So superior oblique muscle depresses the eyeball very well 
or brings it down very well when the eyeball is medially rotated or shifted okay so it depressed downwards and then it will so it depresses the eyeball very well when the eyeball is adapted or moved towards the midline or towards the nose similarly the inferior oblique muscle what does it do follow this arrow it moves the eyeball upwards very well excellently when the eyeball is adapted adapted or towards the nose okay there's another function you should know about these two functions about these two muscles superior oblique muscle it takes part in what you call in torsion or in cyclo torsion other literatures other books other writers other authors talk about what in cyclo torsion but a simpler form of in cyclo torsion is known as what in torsion that is what the superior oblique muscle does. What is in torsion? So, the eyeball has clock hours because it's round. 12 o'clock position is up here and then 6 o'clock position is down here. So, when there is in torsion, which is done by the superior oblique muscle, the 12 o'clock position is shifted nasally like this so automatically when the 12 o'clock position shifts nasally the 6 o'clock position will shift this way so 12 o'clock comes here and then okay and then the 6 o'clock position comes in this other direction so that is what in torsion or in cycle torsion okay again Let's talk about what the inferior oblique muscle does. The inferior oblique muscle takes place, takes part in what you call extortion or in cycle torsion. So we have authors, other literatures, other books. Instead of using in torsion, they can use what? Sorry, extortion. They can use ex cycle torsion. What is ex cycle torsion? What it means is that the 12 o'clock position of the eyeball finds itself placed laterally in that case the six o'clock position will be found in this direction 12 o'clock here and then six o'clock position over here so students we have discussed many things today <clears throat> this serves as a basis for you to better understand when we talk about cranial nerve pulses, nerves that go around the eyeball, help in motor movement and sensory, so and uh, all sensation. So, for example, we'll just give you a gist, okay? If the constrictor pupillary muscle is affected, the constrictor muscle will not work because maybe the muscle, the the nerve which supplies it, is affected. So the people were dilated. Okay. If the superior rectus muscle is affected or there is paralysis of the third cranial nerve, the eyeball will be sent downwards because the rectus muscle, superior rectus muscle cannot elevate. And so on and so forth. But there's something that will help you not only in ophthalmology but in all your other rotations okay <clears throat> remember that we talk about four other neurons the first other neuron being found within the retina the second other neuron at the preterter nucleus the third other neuron neuron found at the gingival nucleus the fourth other neuron found at the ciliary ganglion be it in ophthalmology practice or in other specialties neurosurgery neurology internal medicine in all the specialties any time that you shine light into the pupil and the direct reflects the people constrict consensual reflect the constrict it means that 
there is no retinal problem, there is no optic nerve disease, there is no intracranial lesion. Or if there is, the magnitude is so insignificant clinically that it doesn't have impact on communication of the brain and the eyeball. What do I mean here? If everything is intact, you get your direct and consensual reflex, which means that the pupils will constrict. If there is a lesion, either in the retina, ganglion cell, optic nerve, chiasma, optic tract, or the intracranial or intracerebral portion, you will not get the consent, the direct reflex. The pupil, instead of constricting, will stay the same size or it will even dilate because the constrictor pupillae is not working well. So the dilator muscle will take over and make the pupil become what? Dilated. So when you shine light into the pupil and the pupil does not constrict, it means that there's a problem in the retina at the ganglion cells at the optic nerve, at the chiasma, or save for the problem intracranial or intracerebral. So, how will you know it? Do full eye examination. Take good history and do full eye examination and then assess everything clinically very well. So, students, thank you very much. Uh, this is Obin series again. Learn very hard and when we meet, you can ask more questions and keep following and subscribe. So until we meet again, have a nice day. Thank you very much.